Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Peter Gardner. I'm a technical consultant at Silvertina Software, which is based in the beautiful town of Malmesbury in the UK. And as you can see there, my talk today is entitled Agile Methods and Safety Critical Software, with a subtitle and the important question, are they compatible? My talk is going to be fairly short, probably 15 to 20 minutes. Silvertina specializes in software for the rail and avionics sectors. And not surprisingly, therefore, we've been very much oriented towards the traditional software development methodologies. The company's uh, current development methodology is based on the waterfall model, and we generally, we generally lean towards UML. However, of course, we keep abreast of new developments, and any new developments that might improve the quality of our software and make clients happier is of interest. Uh, for that reason, Silver has established an Agile Methods discussion group to look at Agile Methods and specifically Agile Methods in the context of <coughs> safety critical software. The Agile Club meetings normally draw around 12 people, uh, although in the 12 meetings we've had so far, a total of 32 people of different backgrounds have attended. The meetings are sometimes based around video, sometimes a standard PowerPoint presentation, and of course, always followed by a discussion. It's work done in the Silver Atina group that I'm presenting to you today. So, let's formalize more exactly what my presentation is about. My presentation seeks to answer two questions, those two questions on the slide there. <clears throat> Number one, can agile methods be applied to safety critical software and the software still be rigorously built and meet certification criteria. And number two, what evidence is there for the benefits of agile methods, especially as regards safety critical software? For the first question, I'm going to look at the DO178B and the EN50128 standards, which as I'm sure you know, apply to the avionics and rail sectors respectively. And implicitly, I'm really thinking about the higher levels of those two standards, level A and B for DO178B, and SIL 3 and 4 for EN50128. I'll present the results of a search across the web looking for reports on the use of agile methods in real projects. I divide my source papers, the papers I assemble during the work presented here, into papers about agile methods and non-safety critical software and papers on agile methods and safety critical software. There are far fewer of the latter, as you might suppose, than the former. Of course, there's not just the one agile method, there's a proliferation of them. There's XP, the Crystal family, the agile unified process, and so on. But I think that a certain set of principles apply to agile methods in general and, and collectively. Perhaps some principles apply only to one method, but I think that the list on the next two slides here is probably a good summary of the state of affairs. The two slides contain uh, 20 features. It's uh, first there, first slide has 10, second slide another 10. I'm not going to look at every feature individually, I'm sure you're familiar with most of them. Instead, I'll mention a few and then summarize the situation by colour coding each feature for compatibility with safety critical software development. One of the key features, key features of agile methods is the rearrangement of project development from the waterfall model into a series of short development cycles. Associated with this is the idea that the requirements should be developed stage by stage and not specified for the whole project up front at the beginning of the project. There's no immediate reason why these ideas can't be applied to safety critical software development. We'd have to reorganize other aspects of the software development, but that can be done. Also, agile methods place considerable emphasis on having a customer represent representative co-located with a development team. Other features of agile methods include the pair programming idea of XP, and test-driven development. I've 
considered each of the 20 features and graded them qualitatively for compatibility with safety critical software development. I admit that this is a somewhat subjective process, but it is guided, I hope, by considerable experience. So, how good is the fit? Well, I think it's pretty close. I think 15 out of the 20 agile features can be imported into the safety critical world. I have some reservations on three out of the 20, but nothing serious. I have a problem with one out of the 20, um, where it's said that anyone can change anything. <clears throat> I think that would conflict with the software configuration requirements for DO178B and EN50128, but <clears throat> okay, let's omit that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a real problem with one out of the 20, and that's Agile's reduced emphasis on design and documentation. So here's the two slides again, except this time with the colour coding. Green is okay, amber is, well, maybe. Uh, purple needs working around, that's the one any team member can change anything. But red, the deep red there, is red is a problem. Going through the amber issues, on the first of the colour coded slides, I've made generally for small teams an amber issue. Safety critical projects often, but not necessarily of course, involve large, even very large projects. So if agile methods are generally usually applied in small teams, <clears throat> there may be some adaptation is required. I have made any team member can change anything a purple issue because it brings up issues to do with configuration management, as I mentioned a few moments ago. On the second colour-coded slide, I can see a potential problem with test-driven development Um, which I'll elaborate on below. The red issue is the downgrading of design and documentation in Agile methods. For self-organizing teams, I wonder whether that might conflict in some way with configuration man management issues. But more importantly, why is the reduced emphasis on design and documentation a problem? Well, as I'm sure you know, the DO 178 B and the EN50128 standards have very exacting requirements as regards design and documentation, at least for the higher levels, say level A and B for DO178 <coughs> and SIL 3 and 4 for EN50128. For example, here's a list of the outputs required by DO178B. This is just the first slide. Plans, designs, code, test cases, test results, and similarly, here's a list of the outputs required by EN50128. This is three slides. Plans, specifications, reports. But for both standards, it's not just a matter of writing documentation. The content of the documentation also needs to be derived. Design artifacts, and so on and so forth. 